All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our panel presentation today focused on addressing the infodemic online. My name is Derek Johnson. I am the Associate Director for the Greater Midwest Region of the Network of the National Library of Medicine and based at the University of Iowa. I'm quite excited to welcome you to our session today. And before we hear from our panelists, I do have a few of our standard housekeeping items just to cover quickly. You are all muted on entry, uh, so please be sure to use the chat box to make any questions or comments. Um, and also, when you enter your chat uh, question or comment, be sure to mark all panelists and attendees from the drop down menu so that all of our monitoring staff and attendees can view your questions and, and comments. Um, we are running on a tight schedule, as you know, with just 10 minutes in between sessions, so we are going to make sure that we end on time. Um, and uh, in terms of continuing education, this session is eligible for Certified Health Education Specialist Credit, uh, CHES, as well as CE from the Medical Library Association. We'll be sending an evaluation out to all of our registered attendees and completing that evaluation at the end of the day is your first step in claiming your CE. Finally, this session is being recorded and, and will be made available for future viewing. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Vineet Arora for our session titled Development and Implementation of Impact, the Illinois Medical Professionals Action Collaborative Team to Combat the Infodemic and Improve Vaccine Access and Hesitancy Using Social Media and Community Partnerships. So, Dr. Arora. Thank you so much, and it's lovely to be here, and I will have my teammates introduce themselves um, as we approach their presentations. Um, and so Hopefully I will be able to control the screen here. We have no disclosures. The outline for today's talk, uh, we want to first start off with the introduction for why impact, why did we create impact, as well as delve into specific vaccine studies um, that we have been performing in terms of not only improving access, but also addressing hesitancy in education, including in partnership with the Chicago Public Libraries. And then finally, we'll end with our social media and infographic strategy using some of the theories around debunking that we have been experimenting experimenting with. So the problem, um, I have been uh, very active on social media for many years as a physician and a medical educator. I'm at Future Docs on Twitter, and I saw that many healthcare professionals uh, were reluctant to tackle misinformation because even though we sometimes feel very compelled to do that, um, it's very challenging because a lot of us engage in frontline work, especially when the pandemic started. Um, it's even worse for moms and those that have caregiving responsibilities at home. Um, and this is really challenging because we see that misinformation is a problem in the clinician patient relationship. So funded by the um, ABIM Foundation, I had an opportunity to participate in authoring a review in JAMA about how misinformation affects the clinician patient relationship. The interesting thing about this paper is that this actually was accepted before the pandemic started, even before the first case of COVID in the United States. And so um, it came out, of course, uh, during the pandemic, and we had an opportunity to revise one line to talk about masking. But just to give you some examples and why the examples are dated, but there's pseudoscience, misinformation due to unscientific claims, um, you know, for example, you know, the bleach, junk science, uh, fear of vaccines causing autism. You know, retracted articles. Um, you think about the hydroxychloroquine, outdated science, and this is um, incremental nature of science that's changing. And so the masking issues, inappropriately applied science, where misinformation um, is a result of the fact that there's so much clinical heterogeneity. And so this could be things that we saw in China don't now apply. The B117 is behaving very differently in kids than the prior strains. Conflicting interpretations of science, um, and this is like two different bodies disagree. So the UK and the US, uh, you know, what do we do? One shot versus two. We're seeing all of this play out. We are also seeing uh, physicians take to Twitter and describe their emotional pleas. And does that matter? Well, Rachel Skolnick, who's a physician scientist um, at Michigan, uh, which is experiencing a huge surge here in the Midwest, did a very elegant randomized control trial saying your personal tweets can help stop the spread. And so highlighting in a, in a vignette-based uh, trial that um, an EM physician personally appealing on Twitter was more effective than a 
government agency. And then recently I did discover in preparing for this talk that the Lancet has done a scoping review of 81 studies on the use of social media during COVID-19 and Twitter's most common real-time surveillance of mental health and public sentiment. But of course, social media is a vector in contagion for misinformation, so that's the challenge. So I also have uh, participated with one of our co-authors and co-founders of Impact, Dr. Shika Jane and others in Chicago on a study looking at harassment of uh, physicians who participate in advocacy on social media. Again, uniquely odd that this study was done before the pandemic, but published after the pandemic. Uh, and so one in four physicians report being attacked, one in six female physicians report being sexually harassed, unfortunately, the most common reason for cyberbullying for physicians was advocacy and the number one reason in the advocacy category was vaccines and so as a physician i have been asked by my organization by folks like this is our shot which we are partner with to publicly post about vaccines how am i going to do that and do i feel comfortable if i feel like i'm going to get attacked and so this is why we have seen many other organizations address the need to address harassment online. But I would say that for COVID and for especially for healthcare professionals, there's very little in this space. And so Impact is taking a lead in that. And that is why we started Impact. We started Impact to bring together social media influencers to leverage social and traditional media, as well as community partnerships, all in Illinois, to combat misinformation and medical to trust at a local level in our community, as well as to raise our voice and engage with policymakers. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our co-founder, Dr. Bloomgarden, to talk about how what impact is and how, to, how do we make impact. OK, thank you so much. So I am um, Eve Bloomgarden, and uh, as as just was said, I'm one of the co-founders of Impact. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do and our and our origin story. Um, and uh, I laugh everyone every time someone asks me, "Well, what is Impact?" Because it our, our identity and our mission is a constantly evolving thing. Um, we're we're really more of a potential energy. We can be harnessed and focused towards the issue at hand, depending on what's needed. But really, our our mission and our focus has been to help um, navigate the pandemic and in addressing healthcare inequities. And we do this by harnessing the power um, that we already have, our, our building credibility and reputations as physicians, as parents, as leaders in our institutions and in, in our communities. And we use the intersection of our various identities to make, you know, to allow us to, to um, communicate effectively. So here's what we do. Um, we basically, we, we use this to strategically amplify healthcare worker voices and to guide policymakers and the public during the pandemic. We, lever we leverage social and traditional media outlets to do so. We grow and we leverage novel partnerships. And you can see some of our um, partners at, at the bottom here, their pictures, but we've, we've um, expanded our reach by partnering um, with people locally and also across the country. Um, with various groups, and we crowdsource to identify gaps and issues that need advocacy. Um, we then come up with a recipe for recrafting and repurposing our content and disseminating the message, and um, we use that in our as our cascade for further reach. And again, so here is, um, uh, we've created an advocacy toolkit, um, and it, it's really about how to create an impact. And I'm going to walk through these steps um, in order to um, to kind of show you how how we work. And um, you know, the first one we start with determine your vision. Um, then we organize our team. And I'm going to just walk through these. You can you can see this on our website as well um, to 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 use the toolkit um, to create your own impact. Okay. So step one, determining our vision. And this is where I'm gonna get into our origin story. Um, so I wanna take you back uh, to March 14th of 2020. Uh, this was a Saturday. It was five days before California issued its stay, home, stay at home order, seven days before Illinois did the same, and then eight days before New York. Colleges had just sent, sent students home from across the country. Illinois schools were about to close and bars were full of party goers for St. Patrick's Day. Um, and O'Hare Airport was full of travelers trying to get back from Europe and abroad, packed in. We see um, 
you know, what, what you can imagine incited a lot of panic in a bunch of um, physicians. So we were seeing isolated tweets and posts uh, about, um, you know, about what was going on. We were, we knew what, what was happening um, in Europe and, and in, in Wuhan. And we uh, decided to get together and coordinate an approach. Uh, we noticed a lack of a federal response and we really didn't know where should we focus? Should we focus federally, locally, um, um, at the state level? And we decided our really our greatest um, uh, opportunity would be locally. And so our first night, we actually wrote a letter to the governor. We posted it and obtained hundreds of signatures from healthcare workers um, in Illinois and submitted it to the governor's office all about 14 hours late after these, these images were posted. So the next step um, that I think is really that we want to emphasize is we we organized our team. We deliberately recruited um, partners that, and team members that uh, had the expertise that we lacked. And so we started with our original co-founders. Um, you can see the seven of us pictured here. And then we um, recruited many others. You want to choose a diverse team of individuals with similar goals. And your, um, your team really should include um, you know, people who complement each other. You want everyone to um, really crucially have a social media presence if possible, because that's how we communicate and disseminate our information. And it really does take the whole team. Um, and then we had a, um, on the back end, we organized our team via Slack um, and we would communicate quickly using Slack or Google, Google documents or drives, um, you know, to, in order to quickly share um, information and articles that we were writing and thoughts that we had. Um, so here you have pictured just some of the team members that we've recruited um, uh, that, are, that are now essential parts of our team. And then you pick an issue. And so again, we kind of talked a little bit about how we, how we would crowdsource and kind of identify what the issue at hand was. But some of the, the bigger issues that we've tackled so far, we started with social distancing, um, masking, um, we've moved on to, to vaccines. Really, um, the event of the moment is, is where we would focus and you wanna focus um, one thing at a time um, in order to, to be able to get the most out of it. Um, and um, then you wanna select an advocacy tool. So we, um, you know, we feel that the, the message is only as good as your ability to communicate it. And we've used petitions, op-eds, and uh, letters um, to policymakers, letters to the editor. We've um, kind of continuously wrote and, and harnessed kind of different avenues to, to really uh, garner um, interest and also to share information. Um, and you wanna have a tool um, that you can, you know, so we have a, for example, the change.org um, petition that we have for uh, universal masking and a national masking mandate, we would, write about it, we, we wrote a statement about it, we did a petition about it and an op-ed. And so, you know, we've re repurposed our message in various different channels. So step five is you really wanna actively be able to promote what you're doing on social me media and engage your community. So here, um, we, we've done this in a variety of different ways. We have our own um, social media accounts on multiple different platforms. Um, and we also all have our own personal um, uh, accounts. We um, are fortunate to have one of our co-founders actually is the um, uh, started the Physician Mommy Chicago group with uh, multiple, um, you know, over 2000 members there at the start of the pandemic, something called the Illinois COVID-19 Collective was formed also over 2000 doctors locally. So we had this um, ability to quickly communicate with our healthcare worker community. Um, there were many other COVID-19 specific groups that we're all uh, part of um, and other doctor mom groups as well. Um, we've also partnered um, on Facebook with um, uh, to do Facebook live events and to do um, other collaborations with, with national organizations such as Bomb Club and Beyond. Um, and we also um, do this through um, various mom groups and then our partners networks as well. So some of our partners, um, the Illinois State Medical Society, Dear Pandemic, who you heard speak yesterday, um, Get Me PPE Chicago and uh, Women in Medicine. So we 
Engage with the physicians and the stakeholders, not only to identify needs and gaps, but also to disseminate our information utilizing partnerships. And uh, for example, here's our the Illinois State Medical Society. Um, and this survey is an example of how we partnered with this group who already had a large reach in the medical community. And we use our shared networks to disseminate the survey to doctors in, in Illinois. And uh, the results um, of this survey were really, were featured um, in various uh, local local um, press um, uh, releases, and such as um, in some uh, that that wouldn't weren't medical, so that were communicated to the community um, uh, across uh, that that we wouldn't otherwise reach in our just our medical groups. And this is really about uh, what doctors think um, about various activities and its safety level. And um, this was a very um, popular and I think impactful survey to, to really communicate what we're all doing and what our thoughts are. Um, and it's an example of how we could expand our messaging using the data we collected um, to, to share safe practices. So after all of these steps, um, we, we continue with our recipe. Um, and what this really is, is a repurposing of the content in various ways to reach an even wider audience across multiple platforms. Um, and so for each issue, whether, it, whether we're talking about masking or um, masking in schools or uh, vaccines, um, we, we create infographics, which you're going to hear about in a little bit. Um, we also um, have a, a blog on our website that we have many contributing uh, authors and um, we, we do this for the same, whether it's one of us writing or uh, you know um, somebody who submits a piece, we featured many different uh, people through our blog. And then um, that we have an impactful chat with uh, two of our uh, team members who um, will, will often take an issue at hand and, and pursue it further by interviewing someone. For example, um, they, they had the opportunity to interview uh, Apoorva, um, who, who is one of the New York Times um, journalists who's been very influential during uh, the pandemic. And that, was a, that got a lot of views as well. Um, we do uh, our impact uh, Facebook live chats with Bump Club and Beyond to reach a totally different audience um, than we otherwise would. And we talk about whatever questions are at hand or the issue at hand. Um, and then uh, we're often featured um, for the same messaging. We will talk about it in local or national media. Um, and we've created uh, products and infographics and, and with our partner um, or, uh, partners as well. And just an example, or not an example, but just a list of what we've been able to accomplish using kind of this, this formula. So our, our, our uh, social media platforms um, have over 3,000 followers. I mean, I'm not going to run through every number here, but the big ones to hit um, are some of our hashtags were, you know, had, uh, were shared and used thousands of times. Um, what our petition for national mask mandate has been signed um, by, I think, most recently it was about 100,000 or 112,000 signatures. We um, had a virtual white coats for Black Lives March, which um, unfortunately was Zoom bombed. And uh, the, there's a long story behind that, which um, we've written about. Um, but that has the, the, the video that then came out of that has been watched over a million times. Um, our infographics often get, you know, somewhere between 1,000 and 15,000 views on Facebook alone. Um, and as do our chats. Um, and then we've written 40 plus op-eds and letters to, to the editor, both in Illinois-based uh, media outlets and nationally. We've been um, featured or we've appeared in, in various um, uh, media outlets such as Good Morning America, The Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times, NPR. We've sent 12 advocacy later, letters to our state policymakers to invoke change and uh, also have repurposed those letters into public statements. And so where we started at the beginning of the pandemic was really our identities, our multiple identities, whether we're physicians, we're parents, but we have this built in trust, credibility, um, and empathy because we really are, are intimately um, involved in, you know, wanting, wanting things to, to get better and wanting us to get through this safely. Um, you know, and, and the, this was an example of the article that the Chicago Tribune wrote about us uh, many, many, many months ago, almost a year. And then, um, Finally, we have um, this was this was an article um, that was just um, published in Time magazine talking about um, kind of our joint roles as, as moms and doctors and uh, featuring um, some of our partners as well from Dear Pandemic and um, um, and it was uh, we have some quotes on here which you can read but just about how um, our empathy and our our, our 
our dedication to both being, you know, being physicians and being parents really uh, allowed us to share um, our, our thoughts and communicate and also to tackle the misinformation. Okay, and with that, I am going to pass it along. Um, and you can see the link to the, um, the time article in our in the chat box as well. Great, thank you, Eve. So hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Mordell, and I'm a clinical research coordinator at the University of Chicago for Dr. Aurora. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit and focus on our work with COVID-19 vaccines. So limited vaccine access compounded with vaccine hesitancy has contributed to significant vaccine inequity. So we first kind of want to focus on the access story. So for Illinois, vaccine rollout was divided into four phases. So 1A being healthcare workers, 1B being essential workers and people aged 65 and older, 1C being those aged 16 plus with underlying medical conditions, and then finally culminating in phase two, which will be everybody that wants a vaccine 16 and older. So shortly after uh, phase 1A opened in December, we immediately began seeing issues facing unaffiliated, unaffiliated healthcare workers access to the vaccine. So from social media crowdsourcing, we were able to alert Oak Street Health, which is a value-based clinic network, which one of our co-founders, Dr. Ali Khan, is the executive medical director at. With this information, Oak Street Health was able to partner with the Chicago Department of Public Health to offer easy registration for non-affiliated healthcare workers. We created a vaccine clearinghouse resource on our website as well with Oak Street Health's information as well as other links for vaccine registration for unaffiliated healthcare workers to direct them to these resources. We additionally began amplifying this process on social media for others to be able to do the same and find the resources that they needed. So from this work, we were able to find out that 50% of the thousands of healthcare workers vaccinated by Oak Street Health were actually referred by social media. Our work with the uh, unaffiliated healthcare workers ended up culminating in Dr. Ali Khan speaking at Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot's daily COVID-19 press conference about promoting vaccine equity by encouraging other local healthcare entities to vaccinate non-affiliated healthcare workers, as well as additionally highlight our work. However, our work did not end with the 1A grouping. Shortly after phase 1B began, which was uh, people aged 65 plus and the rest of the essential workers, we not only continued to see the issues people were facing for vaccine registration, but we were also began experiencing those issues firsthand and they took such a more personal meeting for us. We turned to social media and began sharing our own uh, experiences to promote awareness of the issues. Here you can see one of Dr. Aurora's tweets outlining her struggle to find a vaccine for her high-risk family members. Even with her great technological setup, she's still having issues. So the biggest issue we quickly realized were the technical inequities. Many of the eligible patients who have vaccine phase 1B had low technical literacy, uh, probably because they're an older population. Beyond the low technical literacy, the websites to access the vaccines were first come first serve, creating a very big hunger game atmosphere to get a, uh, to get a vaccine. So as a group, we decided to pen op-eds as well as letters to policymakers to end the first come first serve websites and create more accessible options for people to sign up for the vaccine to level the playing field. Um, so as a group, we also decided to create, uh, take further action and develop a vaccine clearinghouse Google document, which is constantly updated in real time. Our clearinghouse has resulted in over 20,000 website hits. Additionally, we join, join the vac Chicago Vaccine Hunters Facebook group, which helps people look for vaccines and provides tips to find vaccines. Also, by being in this group, we're able to keep up to date with like, what is working and what isn't working in real time issues so we can continue to advocate. Finally, our work on vaccine access advocacy resulted in the Illinois Department of Public Health unveiling a phone number rather than solely just an internet sign up for individuals to sign up for the COVID vaccine. Uh, so basically they can just call this number and help find an appointment in their area. Now I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Aurora to discuss the story of vaccine hesitancy. Thank you. Um, vaccine access, of course, is one piece, but what about vaccine hesitancy? And um, I'm really uh, pleased to be able to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, and why is that so important? Well, you know, South Side of Chicago, where I currently am in my office at University of Chicago, 85% um, of our patients here are African American. And we all know that it's really not the Tuskegee experiment that's in their mind. It's this legacy of, of really current day, everyday racism in our healthcare and medical environments that is what leaves our black and brown communities with a distaste and distrust for um, healthcare and for medicine. And that is what we need to try to uh, 
um, combat. Um, we've seen this multiple times, particularly not just in medicine where with research studies, but also in our local community, Mercy Hospital, which is a hospital that serves predominantly minority community, was scheduled to close during the pandemic and it's taken a ton of activism and government uh, work to try to keep it open, but just to highlight that people are struggling with just getting regular care, why would they trust the medical system? Um, age um, adjusted mortality rates also reveal a very important story, which is that our Latinx community is incredibly suffering when you think about um, the age at which people are dying. And so um, something that we need to be um, factoring in, which is age only cutoffs actually are in, in fact inequitable um, and could lead to further disparities and further deaths. Uh, with that, especially thinking about healthcare workers and the group we represent, you know, I remember being uh, in the first wave of healthcare workers um, getting vaccinated, and I was paused, given great pause by understanding that only. 40% um, of healthcare workers in that first phase adopt, adopted the vaccine. And why is that? It turns out that there's a lot of distrust among healthcare workers in getting the vaccine. And so um, again, we went to social media to crowdsource. A policymaker asked us, what is this? Because if healthcare workers aren't getting the vaccine, how are we going to get it out to the community? And so we, uh, through multiple Facebook groups, we sat, asked this question very simply and using uh, the power of social media, sorry, um, we were able to crowdsource the top reasons. And in fact, one of the top reasons which hadn't really been discussed was fertility concerns. Granted, we are moms and many of us are on Facebook are also moms. And so there could be a slant there, but many healthcare workers are also women and young women, especially nurses and social workers and others who might not want the vaccine. And it was important to address those. And so when I turn it over to Serena, she'll talk a little bit about that. Here are some of the other concerns people raised, which you've seen in the news, too rushed or too new, distrust of research, side effects, et cetera. Um, it's not serious for young people. I bring that up given the keynote that we just had about why it's important that young people help. Um, and what factors influence COVID-19 vaccine acceptance? Fortunately, the good news is that if your doctor recommends it, you're more likely to get it. And so we felt we had an important role to play. Illinois is actually a uh, purplish um, state, if you will. So even though Chicago is deep blue, um, you know, we have very red parts of our state and rural parts of our state. We see that with a hospital surge. It's the outlying hospitals in our community and our rural areas that fill first that really take a beating whenever COVID hits. And so the good news about um, this research that looked at surveying, um, you know, Republicans is that your doctor is still very high and the highest up there. And so that led us to act and to think about working with a variety of groups to develop infographics, which you're going to hear about in a moment, advocacy letters, videos, et cetera, to address vaccine hesitancy, including a speakers bureau, which led to a partnership with the Chicago Public Library. I'm one of the investigators on an NLM um, All of Us supplement for um, Chicago's Precision Medicine cohort. And so working through that connection, we were able to make a connection with Chicago Public Library and Dr. Susie Lopez and Dr. Amira Hamed were able to complete video modules for our librarians in our community that are about to go live. So we're very proud of that. Um, and then just to highlight, you know, um, this is a continuing issue and there's going to be infractions and ethical violations. And so if you haven't seen the Loretto Hospital case, um, this is hospital leaders in our community in a predominantly black and brown community. In fact, the hospital that was chosen for the site of the first vaccines and one of our impact members was the first person to be vaccinated in Chicago um, as a Latinx physician. Um, that hospital, um, their leadership was implicated in some scandals um, for um, for these issues. And so um, just highlighting that even the trust that you build is undone so easily that now we have to rebuild this trust again. Um, and we're working with um, the community and Chicago, Dr. Khan with Protect Chicago Plus and our impact team has organized over thousands of volunteers to actually bring vaccine into the community. So instead of having 
having it at the hospitals. Literally, it's brought to the community. Um, the community does flyers. People can walk in and get their vaccine. This is every weekend. Uh, Dr. Hala Akbarnia, one of our other impact members who directs volunteers and community engagement, is one of the big drivers of our volunteers for this. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over, oops, turn it over to Serena to talk about our infographics, and then we will wrap up and take questions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Serena Doan, and I am a clinical research assistant at the University of Chicago, as well as the medical and digital content lead of IMPACT. So now that we've talked a little bit about vaccine hesitancy, I'm going to address another method we use on IMPACT that was touched upon earlier, our infographics. So I'll take you through the steps that we recommend when designing infographics, as well as our infographic series we've created to combat the misinformation and address vaccine hesitancy. One thing to note is that underneath many of our infographics, there will be an outreach number. And these are the number of unique individuals who have viewed our infographics across Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Lisa, can you go ahead and go to the next slide? Thank you. So the first thing that we recommend is to make an infographic to so choose a platform for design such as Vengage, Canva, or Lucid Press. Our team personally uses Vengage, but Canva and Lucid Press are also recommended and very easy to use. And the second thing is we pick a topic and decide the critical information. And so we want to determine what specific knowledge should the reader gain from this infographic, making sure that it's not too broad and not too content heavy, as if as such that if there is too much information, um, the reader will get overwhelmed. We also have to make sure to avoid using too much scientific or technical jargon, as these terms can intimidate the reader and cause them to be less engaged, thus minimizing the effect of the infographic. However, if there is a need to use scientific terms, we, be we are usually sure to implicitly or explicitly define the term within the infographic. The third thing you want to do is arrange the information in a comprehensible manner and also use color to emphasize the main concepts of your infographic. Fourth thing is to be sure to add your logo, website, and any other pertinent details such as the date and sources. The date is especially important for us because COVID-19 news is constantly evolving. So at this point, then the reader will know what knowledge we have at that time. The fifth thing is, is very crucial and is making sure to have people with multiple lenses view the infographic. Our team is fortunately made up of a diverse group of people with different backgrounds, careers, and education levels, as this enables us to design digestible infographics that can be consumed by a wide variety of people. And then finally, what helps IMPACT stand out is that many of our infographics are also translated into Spanish, and this helps us reach more people. These infographics can then also be shared within communities and be utilized for our community outreach program. Go ahead. And then, so there are three main series I will be focusing on today. Um, our COVID-19 vaccine series, our myth debunkers, and our weekend data updates. The vaccine series, one of which, the infographics you can see on the right, uh, they go into depth about each of the US authorized COVID-19 vaccines. So we also touch upon how mRNA vaccines and viral, vac viral vector vaccines were created as well as how the mRNA vaccines were developed so quickly. Our goal with this series is to take all of the data and the information released by the CDC and FDA and condense it into quick facts for the audience to easily understand about the vaccines. The general format of these infographics is to start with a question, lay out the content in an appealing, in, in a, in an appealing manner, and reiterate the question and or answer the question and or answer at the end simply. So as you can see on the right, that uh, the right infographic explains how the mRNA vaccines work. And we begin with the question on the upper left, explain the science behind the vaccine in an easy to understand manner. And finally, we reiterate some major points such as that the vaccine does not give you COVID-19 or change your DNA. And then moving on to our myth busters, these infographics utilize the format developed by Stephen Lewandowski, John Cook, and many more through their debunking handbook 2020. In this text, the authors emphasize that it is important to provide detailed refutations so that in this information can be quote unquote unstuck. They state that debunking is successful if you apply these four components. First of all, you have to state the fact in a simple yet concrete way that frames the message. Second is that you're going to warn about the myth and point to the misinformation. It's really crucial to make sure that we only repeat the misinformation once as repetition can make the information appear true. 
Third, you're gonna explain the fallacy and why the myth is misleading. It's important to provide detailed corrections on why it is wrong and why the alternative is true. So then that way this allows people to see the inconsistencies and change their beliefs on their own. And then fourth, you'll reinforce the fact so it leaves a lasting effect. So on the next slide is an example of one of our myth debunkers. Um, and this is where we address the safety and speed of the COVID-19 vaccines. So we begin with the fact that they are safe and developed at a needed quick and efficient pace. We address the myth. And then below we explain why the myth was wrong, emphasizing that the red tape was bypassed and no trials or safety guidelines were skipped. And finally, we reiterate the facts and elaborate with new information on why the trials were effective. So our, fi our final series is going to be our data updates. And so these are posted each weekend as a two-part infographic. The visual data comes from Jeff Sobchak, our data specialist, who presents Illinois data such as Illinois percent positivity rates, numbers of testing, and ICU hospitalization numbers, and many more. The second part of the infographic is creating a short and effective message that summarizes the graph and presents a plan of action for the future. So the infographic on the right is one of our data updates with the greatest outreach. In this, we highlight that the message is that there is a correlation between testing and percent positivity, and then we provide an action to maintain COVID-19 safety protocols. Outside of our series is though, we also create infographics for different occasions. There are, these are some of the many we've designed where below you can see our total outreach across all of our social media platforms. Some of our popular infographics include from our impact blog, our recent danger of a post spring break surge infographic where we touch upon current travel recommendations, our change.org petition to mask up from last year, and an infographic on staying safe during Halloween. However, we also do expand beyond just digital and social media to also create print resources. So we have created a printable handout. So we have created a printable handout to direct individuals to our vaccine resources. And we also have a brochure in works that is an accumulation of several of our vaccine series and myth debunker infographics. Having both in print and digital infographics enables us even more to expand our outreach and combat the misinformation. A recent Stat-Harris study also found that 21% of Generation Z said that they would not get vaccinated and 34% said that they would wait and see, many stating that the lack of targeting to the younger demographic as the reason why. One of IMPACT's current goals is to reach this younger audience through Instagram using hashtags and other social media strategies. There is a need to target young people and this is a demographic we're encouraged to reach. So now I'd like to pass it back to Dr. Aurora to conclude. Thank you, Serena. And I think you would all see that we're all a team and it's a team sport. And uh, Serena has taught me so much about social media and um, and young people that I think can it's really important for people to partner with young people to understand how to reach them. And through that, I'm very eager and excited to say that that's what impact has done too. So we really are about lifting future leaders, not just highlighting them on our blogs. Um, and so many of the students that have done value added work like Masks Now Illinois, which is one of our partners led by an 18 year old high school student who's with district she her team over 80,000 cloth masks in Illinois, many to black and brown communities. We also have a partnership with the um, UIC, University of Illinois College of Medicine, Urban Medicine program uh, through Dr. Jane, who's here. And these are many of our um, students who actually keep us going in a variety of ways um, and keep the rhythm going, especially as all of us have our volunteering. And so this is a side gig for all of us, but we do it because we feel that it's very important. Um, and so uh, with that, I do want to wrap up. And um, Lisa, do you mind just advancing a little bit for me? So um, so if we go to the next slide, just the lessons learned, um, healthcare worker voices have never been more needed. And I will tell you, one of the things that I've noticed very carefully as a hospitalist is when the surge comes to your area, the healthcare voices quiet down. 
And that's when you know there's trouble. Um, every day I look at Michigan and I look at my colleagues in Michigan and I know that they're not active saying much and occasionally they'll say something and it's not good. And I'm like, this is a problem. Um, and so that's how you know that healthcare workers are struggling. They don't have time. Everybody's been deployed. A lot of their institutions are under fire. And so that's where we come in. We're stronger together and we're stronger as a community. And so um, as we represent many, many institutions in Illinois, it's not about each, we're not out to get anybody's institution. We can maintain trust in the community because we are a group of people that are everywhere. Um, we take the baton, but we pass the baton too. We, social media has turned a lot into traditional media. So we get contacts every day by traditional media and we try to direct it to the right team member or we go into our Facebook groups and we say, you know, our radio station is looking for people to talk about the vaccine, who can do this? And we routinely pass on opportunities. We've learned to amplify and support each other through the thick and thin. I always say lead from where you stand. And so when we started Impact, the question was, well, what should we be? And I thought, well, we're healthcare workers and we're in Illinois. And at the time I thought a regional approach was gonna be really important because so much of the gating criteria and what was happening to our communities as physician moms and as healthcare workers mattered because it was local. And then skate to where the puck is going. A lot of times what's happening is we react to the information that's just in front of us today. But we know that with COVID, with the lag in hospitalizations, with the moving part about vaccines, you have to project where is your community gonna be in a week? Start creating the infographic that you need Net for next week, this week. And then think outside the box for those partnerships. We've had a wonderful partnership with Bump Club and Beyond, which came to us through um, Eve Bloomgarden, through a colleague of hers, um, which has allowed us to reach hundreds of thousands of moms across the nation to talk about their questions around vaccine, going to the hospital, getting doctor's appointments. That's been very helpful. And we've been able to connect them with other resources as well, thinking about those community partnerships as well as libraries and the Chicago Public Library. So thanks Kate for being on here as well. So uh, with that, um, we can go to the next slide and I'll just encourage you to follow us on social media um, and uh, we're, we have some time for questions. And so um, we can go ahead and stop sharing our screen. And um, we didn't want to um, talk the entire time, uh, but would be happy to take questions from the audience. Um, and I'd be happy to moderate those questions. I did see, we did answer a few questions as they came up. Um, and I know we have some of our team members in the audience who can also help. Um, so with that, thank you very much. And I'm seeing a few things. Um, so thank you. Um, could we put our social media handles in the chat? Yes, so we can do that. Serena, do you mind putting all the impact social media uh, channels in the chat? I will put in my Twitter handle and Eve can put in hers. Um, I will say um, for those of you who might be from libraries who are looking to start social media presence um, or amplify your social media presence, I will say partner with those clinicians in your communities, partner with others. Um, oftentimes, um, I've been surprised by how uh, people don't recognize libraries uh, oftentimes as a partner. And so sometimes you have to, you know, skate to them to say, hey, we're out here. So um, I'm a big believer and I we sponsor, I sponsor the li embedded librarian service and our librarian Caitlin Van Campen spoke yesterday about that. Um, Thank you for all of you for the uh, for your comments. I do see a few questions regarding advocacy tools. Um, do you find that some are more effective than others at reaching certain audiences? Eve, do you want to take that? Sure. Yeah. No. This is um, this is a really great question. Um, absolutely. You know, you have to know what what tool when you choose a tool. You want to know what what your goal is, and so. If you know, if we're writing um, a petition um, that that's very different than a letter to the editor, or very different than a, a, a letter to the governor, um, you know. So I think the um, when we're trying to reach just the community at large, we really will focus on um, our our infographics and our our social media posts, as well as our our local news posts, and um, we'll usually write a letter to the editor um, in in our it, for the local um, Chicago, um, you know. Uh, 
media outlets. And then when we're trying to just raise awareness about an issue that we think is not, it's not really Illinois focused, um, we tend to do that uh, across our social media platforms um, and also using our impactful chats um, because uh, we, we just reach a different art audience and we have the ability to really, um, you know, it, we, we don't want it to target just a very small community. And that was one of the things with the, the survey that we showed you, it was able to, we were able to disseminate that from doctors. So it was doctor's opinions that really went out um, to, you know, all ages and all different types of people who subscribed just to local, local Chicago events. Um, you know, it, it was really, um, uh, you know, so yes, the advocacy tool absolutely will matter. Um, and so you want to know who you're targeting and what your goal is, and then pick that tool or use multiple tools. I've also been asked, uh, so Illinois, as so although we're in Illinois, we do help support several people in the Midwest. So if you are, I know that this is, uh, you know, we've got a Midwest uh, lib uh, NLM contingent on. So there are physicians and clinicians in Iowa and Minnesota in Wisconsin that we, Michigan, that we are very connected to that are also very active on social media that are interested in organizing and may not have you know, had the partnership or the reach out to. And so, um, so just to keep in mind that uh, there are those folks at your, at your institutions. Another question, any ideas on how to build a community to counter the small but extremely vocal anti-vaccination voices? So I'll take this one and I'll be curious. I know Dr. Jane is on, so I did wanna also mention um, early on in the pandemic, um, you know, sh through the work in the Chicago Tribune. So traditional media, social media and advocacy leads to earned media and earned media is part of the equation at reaching everybody. And so Dr. Jane has a recurring segment on Fox 32 News. Um, and you might wonder, you know, why Fox 32, but it's important to get good information out to everybody. And she's able, so when, when we talk about an advocacy issue like the tech issues or the, um, we try to tell everybody on the team, whether you're a blog or a podcaster or you're a tweeter or you're a Facebook group moderator like Laura or you're Shika that's on TV um, or you're just working in the ER that day, this, guys, here's the issue. It's tech access. Here are the tools so that everybody is making that. And here is the op-ed to amplify so that everybody is really um, laser focused on the same issue. So regarding those anti-vaccination voices, I would say that this is where working as a group matters. And so sometimes you are attacked. Dr. Jane is one of our um, founders um, who actually was attacked by a uh, Chicago radio station and, um, um, you know, for talking about staying at home. And, um, and that can be really frustrating. And so we've done research on this to show, I mean, if you're already morally distressed and burned out after patient care, I mean, there was a catastrophic level of burnout in a National Academy report on healthcare burnout before the pandemic. <laughs> Imagine what you feel after work and then checking your social media like you're going to just want to shut down and not say anything. But if you have a team, what you'll do is you'll go to your team and say, guys, this, this, what do I do? And the answer is you don't do anything because what we often do on social media through advocacy is we call the cavalry. So I will then put out the beacon and say, guys, you know, let's, let's come in, you know, we're coming in hot and we're going to come in hot and we're addressing this misinformation. We do that over and over again when we need to. We don't always need to, and this is where we've gotten formal training. Um, as women in medicine, we uh, sponsored a formal training with um, with the folks that really work on this with experts, um, and some of that's listed on our website if you're interested. And um, and we found that the key is sometimes you can ignore. You some folks, I mean, Emily Landon is one of our epidemiologists who's our scientific advisor. She's got tons of people following her because she's routinely at the governor's conference. She's routinely on TV, but that brings out a lot of other people who are really going after her personally. We encourage her not to respond. We will respond. And it, the key is it enables her to keep going. And so the goal is we don't want to silence the voice of truth. We want to enable her voice to keep going, but we don't want her to get stuck with other things. And the other thing is to keep in mind that some of those voices are very 
they are small and they sometimes are bots that don't have a lot of followers and an authentic voice will always matter. So using the impact account, it's very effective when we post a, an article. And so Shika often will post articles, we'll post infographics, we'll post web hits to our website. And some people will say, why do you do that? Well, it turns out that de debunking, sometimes the person you're actually going up against, you're never going to change their mind. But there's a really important bystander effect where people are watching you do this. So this happens on all of our, Serena can speak to watching our social media feed on Facebook, and we get detractors and we will sometimes hide and mute them. And at other times we'll post articles so that others will see that we actually have a credible voice. And people have said, uh, for example, that, um, you know, oh, you know, that was great how you did that. I really liked that. Or, you know, this doctor said this. So don't forget about the bystander effect. It's very powerful and important to, re to be able to debunk information, not just for the person um, that you are going up against, but for the others that are watching. So a few questions. Okay. Um, how do we communicate and coordinate internally? What a great question. If others want to set up a coalition, what do we do? Thanks, Shika. I'm going to turn this over to Lisa and Serena. I mean, as you can see, I am often, uh, I'm a vision person. I am not a logistics person. Uh, and even I and our team, Shika and others, are supported by so many others. So Lisa, do you want to tackle the question in the chat and then turn it over to Serena to talk a little bit about how, the, how you guys work with our interns and the social media team. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a very, very active Slack channel. I think we have 50 members on it, but I think the number one thing that we've uh, like set out to all of our members is participate when you can, where, where you want to. So there's no pressure for anybody to jump in or like feel the need to be in all, I think 30 channels that we have within the Slack workspace. So join what you want, where you want to participate. So that helps us like restrict burnout. But beyond that Slack, we're able to do real time. We only meet once a month as a group and the meeting once a month as a group is more so of a place to just be able to get to know each other's faces. Majority of us haven't met in person. Like I've never met Eve. So most of us have never actually met in person. Me <laughs> So it's all about being able to constantly have real time connection. Uh, additionally, whenever we're making uh, documents, op eds, letters, it's all via real time editing on Google Docs. So we'll just post the link in our Slack channel with everybody who wants to participate to be able to put in their two cents and that kind of thing. Um, Serena, I'll let you go for the interns. Yeah, so we are really lucky, lucky to have a good group of interns um, and we have about six Four, uh, four, five or six interns at this point. Um, and one thing we just really emphasize is that while there, we don't meet up, it, we only have our monthly meetups, it is really important to be communicative over the platforms that we are using. So for social media and infographics, for example, we will just use Facebook and make sure that we are consistently either checking in, being sure to be responsive. Um, and if, as long as everybody is able to stay up to date on their parts um, and we split the work so it's manageable then everyone is able to get their get what needs to be done and have all the infographics done and it's also where we have a sort of conveyor belt where it'll start at it'll start with one intern and then it'll get passed on to another person and then it'll go to review with me and one of the advisors for the infographics team and then it may go back to get more editing done so it's just this conveyor belt system, it just allows us to be very efficient and also make sure we are being effective with everyone's time and making, putting out the infographics in a very, in an easy manner. Uh, we got a great question about other states. And I do want to say we have uh, talked, um, you know, we, we have partnered with, um, this, uh, you know, the Dear Pandemic group, um, Lindsay Leninger, who's one of the nerdy girl CEOs in chief is somebody who I actually trained with um, at the Harris School of Public Policy. So from the beginning of the pandemic, actually Eve connected her with her through a Facebook moms group and said, do you know her? And I'm like, yeah, we know each other. And so just leveraging every partnership we had, we often are working very closely with um, national groups as well right now um, on vaccine hesitancy. We've partnered with the Made to Save group, um, as well as one of the HHS uh, partners on 
on some of the work that they're doing. Um, in terms of, I'm very interested in the idea of state-based coalitions, and this is why, because healthcare is local and trust is local. And so much of reaching patients where they are is about your local community. And so I, that's what really attracts me to this model and why we've worked so hard to make it presentable here. And so we would be very excited to work with any of you to implement. Uh, uh, we do have a variety of people who have reached out to us um, and others who we are talking to more informally from St. Louis, Massachusetts that have similar state-based organizations, particularly around the mask mandate. When, when the mask, you know, the thing about masking is that it required local pushing, sometimes in municipalities, particularly in red states, to get that mask mandate to hold. So we have connections in Alabama, in Texas, um, in um, Oklahoma. Um, so I was getting texted by people, physicians and healthcare workers that were literally in the council being like, we're speaking up about this. And so, um, so again, through Facebook, through a lot of the work that we have done through a variety of other Facebook groups, that's when people find out about us and we say um, one of our very first letters around sheltering in place we we lobbied for the shelter in place that Illinois got we created a letter template that we put up and said any other clinicians anywhere in your the nation please use this letter template and Iowa was able to use the letter template and others were too and so again not every government is going to be as respond as responsive but the key is keeping clinicians engaged I know is a big piece of fighting burnout and making sure people can speak up up when they can. And so the key I would say is, you know, we're in the pandemic, the pandemic will end. Um, issues like racism and, um, you know, oppression, like uh, gun violence, these are things that are going to require a similar level of engagement between clinicians and policymakers and advocacy and the public to bring those issues to rise. And so I don't think that this is, if you, if you think about this, I think that in in some ways, this is an awakening as opposed to just a temporary thing. So we're not in it. Obviously, a year later, we're not in it for the for the temporary. We're in it to to stay in it and help people. So I would encourage folks. Um, we'll put in our email into the chat, Lisa. If you can throw in our email, um, if any of you are interested, we'd be happy to convene a call to understand a little bit more about people's needs and how we can help support the connections to other people. All right. Well, thank you so much um, to our panelists. We are just about out of time. And so I want to you know, wrap things up as links and emails are going in the chat box. Um, so many great resources. Um, thank you all for your time today, but also thank you for all of your work. Um, I mean, incredible amount of work at, you know, in the past year. Uh, it's amazing that all of this has been done, um, really making a difference and, and, and fantastic for us to hear about that. Um, I do want to uh, let our participants and remind our participants again that this is a session that's eligible for both uh, Certified Health Education Specialist CE as well as MLA CE, um, and that uh, completing the evaluation that you will receive via email at the end of this uh, conference uh, today is the first step in claiming that CE. Our next session will start in just about 10 minutes. so. We'll uh, close down the Zoom meeting now. And thank you again to all of our panelists for your work and your time. Thank you.